For the last four decades, dietary fat and cholesterol have been the villains in heart disease. You very seldom see the word saturated fat in the public press when they're not associated with artery clogging. So it's, it's like it's all one term, artery clogging saturated fats. But now some medical experts are coming forward to challenge this medical paradigm. I think it's a huge misconception that saturated fat and cholesterol are the demons in the diet. And it is 100% wrong. Saturated fat has been vilified for years because of the cholesterol theory. A multi-billion dollar food industry has fueled our phobia of fat and cholesterol and dramatically influenced our diet. That's not science, that's marketing. It's lived past its expiration date and it's one of these hypotheses that just won't die. Have we all been conned? In this episode, I'll follow the road which led us to believe that saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease and reveal why it's been touted as the biggest myth in medical history. The food industry has shaped our ideas about heart health with TV ads like this one. So join me in the Uncle Toby's Oats Cholesterol Challenge! Lowering our cholesterol has been a running theme with the food industry. People have this fear of cholesterol because they've been bombarded with it so much uh, in the media that it's bad and it's going to cause heart disease. That's why all these things are emblazoned with cholesterol free. These advertising campaigns are at the behest of our peak health authorities. The National Heart Foundation guidelines are pretty clear. We're told to reduce our saturated fat and cholesterol levels in order to reduce our risk of heart disease. But many doctors are now suggesting we need to radically rethink this approach. One of those doctors challenging this medical dogma is California-based nutritionist, Dr. Johnny Bowden. When you look at the data, it's very clear everything that we have been told about saturated fat and cholesterol is a bold-faced lie. It's just not so. But isn't there good science behind this? If you look at the science that actually the dietary guidelines were based on, the early stuff this was so badly done, it's so filled with confirmation bias, it would never even pass muster today. And unfortunately, most doctors don't know this. Dr. Ernest Curtis is astonished at how medicine has gilded the lily on cholesterol. During medical school, I was taught the same thing everybody else was, the importance of cholesterol and so forth, and I saw no reason to doubt it. But once I got into the cardiology field itself, I was seeing people with heart attacks that had cholesterol all over the place, high cholesterol, low cholesterol, in the middle, it didn't seem, didn't seem to matter. And at first I thought, well, okay, these are probabilities, so there'll be exceptions. But it turned out that after a while I was seeing far too many exceptions. So that motivated me to go back and look at the origins of these theories. And quite frankly, given the certainty with which we were taught this, it surprised me to find out how poor the evidence was, a virtually non-existent. Cardiologist Dr. Stephen Sinatra said he routinely ordered patients to lower their cholesterol with medications, but now admits he was wrong. I used to be the poster boy for the drug companies, and when I was chief of cardiology, I used to write for statins all the time. I really believed in the cholesterol theory of heart disease. I first became skeptical of the cholesterol theory in like the mid-80s. I was doing coronary angiograms, and you know, you place a tube in the groin, and goes up into the heart, and you can see if this blockage is there. So sometimes I would do the angiogram on a person with a high cholesterol, thinking I was gonna find a lot of disease, and I, many times I didn't find disease. And the converse was true. You know, I, I would do somebody with a low cholesterol and expecting not to find disease, and I found disease. So I was starting to think, maybe I don't have this right. Maybe cholesterol is not the enemy we think it is. so paranoid about cholesterol, we've actually forgotten it's essential for life. It's a major component of brain and nerve tissue and central for the production of hormones. In fact, it's so important that virtually every single cell in the body makes it. A 
Aside from people with a genetic condition like familial hypercholesterolemia, diet has long been the focus of how we can lower our cholesterol. The idea that saturated fat clogs your arteries by raising cholesterol first gained traction in the 50s. American nutritionist Ansel Keys became intrigued with the soaring rates of heart disease after World War II. The facts are simple. Do you know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease? He compared the rates of heart disease and fat consumption in six countries. It was almost a perfect correlation. The more fat people ate, the higher the rates of heart disease. Except there was just one problem. Keyes withheld data for 16 other countries. Later, when researchers plotted all 22 countries, the correlation wasn't so perfect. Dr. Michael Eads is critical of the way Ansel Keyes excluded countries that didn't fit his hypothesis. He more or less cherry-picked countries you could show just the opposite. You could show that the more saturated fat people ate, the less heart disease they had if you cherry pick the right countries. Dr. Eads says that even if fat consumption trends in the same direction as heart disease, it doesn't prove anything. Just because there's a correlation doesn't mean that there's causation. It's like people who are fat have big belts, but that doesn't mean that if you go and buy a smaller belt, you won't be fat. I mean, that's not causation. You know, that's what these observational studies show, it's just a correlation. The classic study by Ansel Keys is a textbook example of fudging the data to get the result that you want out of a study. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that that goes on. Science writer Gary Taubes says it's all very well to have a theory, but in science, you have to prove it. And they tried. And over the next 15 years, uh, researchers did uh, trial after trial, and there were probably a half a dozen of them between 1960 and 1975, all refuted or failed to confirm the idea that you could live longer by either reducing the saturated fat in your diet or reducing the total fat in your diet. The American Heart Association was also reluctant to lend credence to Key's theory. But then he managed to score a position on the association's advisory panel, where he pushed for the acceptance of his ideas. And it wasn't long before they had a change of heart. Instead of the data not being good enough to claim that dietary fat was a cause of heart disease, they concluded that the data were good enough and therefore uh, all Americans over the age of two should go on low-fat diets. As the idea gained widespread acceptance with the public, science was left to catch up. Two ambitious trials costing over $250 million involving hundreds of thousands of patients both failed to prove that lowering saturated fat could reduce your risk of dying from a heart attack. The way the authorities responded to this was to claim that they must have done the study wrong. Instead of saying, hey, look, eating a low-fat diet doesn't apparently do anything for people, or certainly not women, instead they respond by putting out press releases saying, look, we don't know why this trial failed to confirm our hypothesis, but it doesn't mean that the advice we've been giving you is wrong, and it doesn't mean that the hypothesis that dietary fat causes heart disease is wrong. The National Heart Foundation of Australia defends these failures, saying that nutrition trials are just too complex. When you ask that question of, do dietary fats increase heart disease, you're um, sort of trying to negate all the other risk factors that in fact actually also cause heart disease. So to imagine creating a study that would prove that conclusively, it's virtually impossible. So if they can't prove it, on what basis have they decided that saturated fat is bad for us? Eat too much fatty food and you risk a high level of blood cholesterol building up in your arteries. Eat sensibly. Meta-analyses have in fact actually shown that you know, we can say with convincing evidence that uh, intake of saturated fats leads to an increase in blood cholesterol. An extensive review of the literature showed the data was highly inconsistent. In fact, there were many long-term studies that refute the idea that saturated fat raises cholesterol. 
So I approached the National Heart Foundation for further evidence. They said the data was complex. They cited one study which showed only certain types of saturated fat could raise bad cholesterol, but it also raised good cholesterol. In the end, they concluded, we agree, we are limited by the evidence base available at this time. Study called the Heart Study. I asked Australia's leading lipid expert what he thought. So should we be giving people dietary advice if there is such poor adherence and the studies aren't available? I think there are uh, some very telling pieces of evidence which have been used to establish the, the importance of avoiding saturated fat. If saturated fat is completely benign, if it's actually beneficial, where's the evidence in support of that? Where's the evidence of an alternative cause? And we are particularly keen to get some dietary advice because otherwise, what do we offer people? But Dr Curtis disagrees with giving people dietary advice when he believes the evidence is insufficient. He says diet has very little influence on your blood cholesterol in the long term. The reason for that is that your body manufactures 80 to 90 percent of your cholesterol. Really very little of it comes from the diet. Most people seem to have a genetically preset level for the cholesterol in their body, and it, and it may be in a range, but uh, they're generally going to seek to stay within that range. So if somebody cuts all the cholesterol out of their diet, their body will simply start making a little bit more to bring it back up into the range. In the 60s, British physician John Newtkin challenged Key's theory claiming that sugar was the culprit in heart disease, not saturated fat. But Keyes was politically powerful and publicly discredited Yudkin's theory. By the early 1970s, Ansel Keyes was ridiculing John Yudkin and his theory in papers. And just on the basis of that sort of personality and political struggle, the nutrition community embraced this idea that saturated fat was a problem working through dietary cholesterol and began to think of the idea that sugar could cause heart disease as akin to quackery. And Yudkin was eventually ridiculed. Keyes won the diet war, helped by his rise to fame after appearing on the cover of Time magazine. This widespread publicity meant that Key's theory went from weak hypothesis to medical dogma. It would turn out to be one of the most significant events in the history of post-war medicine. The consequences of this study would reverberate over the next several decades to influence public opinion, government policy and the way doctors practice medicine today. The most influential and respected investigation into the potential causes of heart disease was carried out here in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. It began in 1948 and is still going on today. It's the longest observational study of its kind, involving over 5,000 residents. The Framingham data pointed out very early that certain habits or well, what you did, like cigarette smoking or emotional stress, did point in the direction of heart disease. But then something happened. Some of these Framingham residents were living longer than others. When researchers went to look at the data 30 years later, they found that after a certain age, it didn't matter what your cholesterol level was. Cholesterol did correlate with heart disease, but that disappeared by the time you reached your late 40s. After the age of 47, high cholesterol is probably protective. The people who had the highest cholesterol lived the longest, much to the amazement of a lot of the researchers. People who ate the most cholesterol, ate the most fat, actually weighed the less and were the most active. One of the Framingham researchers became so dismayed with the results, he wrote a scathing review of the whole diet heart hypothesis, saying that people had been misled by the greatest scientific deception of our times, the notion that animal fat causes heart disease. Hundreds of articles refuting the cholesterol hypothesis have been published in the world's leading medical journals, but they rarely get noticed by mainstream media. 
What you do in bad science is you ignore any evidence that's contrary to your beliefs, your hypothesis, and you only focus on the evidence that supports it. In 1977, the US government stepped in. Senator George McGovern, an advocate of Ansel Key's theory, headed a committee hearing to end the debate once and for all. And they are the ones that really have put us in the nutritional mess that we're in now because based on virtually zero science, they decided that a low-fat diet was the best thing for us all. Eminent scientists at the time disagreed with the report. That's why I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. But their pleas fell on deaf ears. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does of waiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. News reports began peddling the same message. And many say it was this article in Time magazine that put the final nail in the coffin for saturated fat and cholesterol. This led to the creation of the Food Pyramid, which formed the basis of our dietary advice in the following four decades. It advised us to eat less saturated fat, mainly found in meat and dairy, recommending a diet rich in carbohydrate foods like breads, grains and cereals. McGovern himself was from a big wheat growing state, so it didn't hurt him politically that uh, people moved away from uh, foods of animal origin into breads and, and pastas. There is one diet that stands out from the rest, the Leon Diet Heart Study, which touted the benefits of a Mediterranean diet. Remarkably, after several years, those on the Mediterranean diet had a whopping 76% less deaths from heart attacks. So why did the Mediterranean diet get such a spectacular result when all the others had failed? I'll explain why later, but one of the most interesting things to come from that study went virtually unnoticed. Here's the part that nobody talks about. So you'd think that in the group that had the double-digit reduction in heart disease, their cholesterol levels must have plummeted, right? The cholesterol levels didn't budge. Both groups had the same cholesterol levels, except one group just stopped dying. So, so much for the relationship between cholesterol and the risk for heart disease. This is the average amount of saturated fat a person consumes in a month. Atherosclerosis begins when plaques build up in the arteries. If saturated fat can clog this pipe, imagine what it's doing to yours. But contrary to popular belief, Neither saturated fat or cholesterol deposit on the artery wall like sludge in a pipe. Nobody knows what begins the process, but damage on the artery wall causes inflammation. The body responds by recruiting cells to fix the problem. Tissue cells called macrophages clean up the debris, which consists of things like bacteria, calcium, and cholesterol. A fibrous cap grows over the plaque trying to conceal the inflammation. If the cap bursts, the plaque's contents are released and a clot may block the artery, after which a heart attack ensues. Dr Curtis has a theory on what initiates the damage that begins atherosclerosis. Arteries are constantly branching off one from another and at these branch points is a very common place to find these plaques. The study of fluid dynamics shows this is where the artery experiences the most stress from the tremendous pulsatile force of blood coursing through the artery at high pressure. Veins don't endure the same pressure as arteries, so they never develop plaques. The veins that simply return the used up blood to the heart to get reoxygenated and then not under the same stress. And veins don't develop atherosclerosis unless you put them in a situation where they have to function as arteries. And this may happen when surgeons use veins in heart bypass surgery. Now, 
that portion of the vein is receiving the same arterial pressures. Those coronary bypass grafts and veins here will develop atherosclerosis very quickly. It is never seen in their native state. But because cholesterol is found in the plaques, it's often blamed for causing it. If you go in and you do autopsies of people who have had coronary artery disease and you cut open the coronary arteries, they're filled with cholesterol. So it's not a big leap to say, gosh, I shouldn't eat that because it's gonna go right into there, but that's not the way it works. Dr. Sinatra says blaming cholesterol for causing plaques is like blaming firemen for causing fires, just because they're always at the scene. Cholesterol is really not the villain. I mean, we, we, we need it to live. The problem is, is cholesterol is involved in a repair process. Look, cholesterol is found at the scene of the crime. It's not the perpetrator. And where I sit now as a cardiologist, practicing cardiology for over four decades, it's very low down on my list of risk factors. Cholesterol is a waxy substance that doesn't dissolve in the blood, so it has to be ferried around by proteins, mainly LDL and HDL. LDL is said to deliver cholesterol to the tissues, hence it's bad, and HDL is said to remove cholesterol from plaques, hence it's good. You know, small needles are good. But when Dr Sinatra has his annual blood test, he says he's not that concerned about cholesterol. What about the bad cholesterol? You call it the LDL, bad cholesterol? Well, you know, I don't really call it bad unless it's oxidised. Remember, if it's oxidised, then it's inflammatory. So cholesterol's not bad only if it's oxidised? Exactly. If the cholesterol is oxidised, if there's free radical stress involved and it's oxidised, that's inflammatory and that sets the cascade for inflammation. Well, the inflammatory theory of heart disease, I think, is accepted more and more now. I think the general cardiovascular community is still focusing on cholesterol. They need to focus more on inflammation. And that's where, you know, emotional stress, but sugar, sugar is really the foe when it comes to cardiovascular disease. You see, we placed all this emphasis on cholesterol, we've taken it off sugar. And that's the problem. Then you're getting more insulin responses. And we know that insulin is the number one indicator for inducing what we call inflammation of blood vessels. Sugar is far more damaging to the heart than fat ever was. And we're beginning to see this now. So this focus on cholesterol has been incredibly destructive because we haven't looked at these real promoters of heart disease, inflammation, oxidative damage, sugar in the diet, and number one with a bullet, stress. Dr. Grenfell says these theories are untested, but plausible. These are still hypothetical uh, uh, questions that uh, need to be answered about why does high blood pressure cause damage to the artery walls. I mean, these are all fantastic ideas and how fantastic it would be if we, uh, we found that uh, there were simple ways of preventing heart disease by lowering our body's inflammatory response and also its enthusiasm to, in this hypothesis, to heal itself or to heal holes in the arteries. So it's also plausible that maybe cholesterol isn't the driving factor in this process. It's a contributor. Dr Sullivan does concede that an aspect of the food pyramid was a mistake. He says replacing fats with carbohydrates didn't help the rising obesity problem. If you replace fat with carbohydrate, uh, you will probably uh, be a little bit more inclined to be hungry, your insulin levels will be a bit higher, you'll have higher levels of triglyceride, higher levels of glucose and less of your good cholesterol to avert problems. We certainly probably gave some advice which was a good way to avert one pathway but people then tracked down another pathway and that's what's led to the revision of dietary guidelines. The more recent advice is to replace saturated fat with unsaturated fats in order to lower the risk of heart disease. For example, swapping butter with margarine. It's very hard to find any positives about butter in terms of its uh, impact on cardiovascular disease. But this advice still receives its fair share of opposition. 
Margarine is a perfect example of the stupidest nutritional swap out in history. We had this trans fat laden, crappy manufactured product that we were eating because we were so phobic about saturated fat and cholesterol. To switch to polyunsaturated fats with the vegetable oils, that's horrific advice. The polyunsaturated fats, the vegetable oils, these omega-6 oils are inflammatory because they're very prone to oxidation. Have we been given the wrong advice? <laughs> We've absolutely been given the wrong advice. People became afraid of saturated fats, so they said, okay, we've got to do something to replace the saturated fats, and so let's do it with vegetable oils. Well, vegetable oils don't have the same cooking qualities that saturated fats do. Polyunsaturated fats have a lot of double bonds in them, and double bonds are prone to free radical attack. It becomes a rancid fat, and it becomes really bad for you. And saturated fats, on the other hand, have no double bonds. That's why they're incredibly stable. That's why they're great for cooking. That's why they're great for frying. And that's why they don't really perpetuate free radical cascades in the body, because they're inert fats. They're mainly just Dr. Eads says fat. butter and coconut uh, are not harmful to your health uh, and recommends those fats uh, over the omega-6 vegetable oils. When vegetable oils are used to manufacture margarine, they undergo a process called partial hydrogenation, which results in the formation of industrial trans fats. And everybody agrees they're bad for you. It's important to look for products that have them removed, although Australia doesn't have mandatory labelling of them. Junk food, for example, is riddled with industrial trans fats. The omega-3s, another type of polyunsaturated fat found in fish, for example, are thought to counter the inflammatory effects of omega-6s. The two of them are kind of like the accelerator and a brake pedal on a car. And if they're in balance, uh, things operate smoothly. I mean, you don't want too much anti-inflammatory, you don't want too much pro-inflammatory. Because of the advent of vegetable oils, we now have tons of omega-6 fats and really very little omega-3 fats. This is thought to be why the Mediterranean diet was so successful. It was higher in omega-3 fats, not to mention it was low in refined carbohydrates like sugar and rich in antioxidants. The Heart Foundation still suggests uh, that a diet that substitutes saturated fats for polyunsaturated fats is one that is healthier for your heart. But opposition to this advice is still palpable. It took decades to really entrench this myth. It's probably going to take a few more decades to get us out of this myth. But to vilify saturated fats, um, I think, is one of the worst things the medical profession has done. I'd love to see the medical establishment saying, whoops, we were wrong. That's not going to happen. Uh, frankly, <laughs> that generation is going to have to die off. And perhaps uh, the generation coming up can, can do better. We created this new disease called hypercholesterolemia. And if we created this new disease, we got to create drugs to neutralize it. So are there corporations and billions of dollars and, and, and money behind this? Absolutely. We've been told that medications to lower cholesterol will save lives. We repeatedly hear from patients that their doctors told them, if you don't take this, you will die. Over 40 million people worldwide take drugs to lower their cholesterol. But now there's evidence that the majority of them won't benefit. None of those people are less likely to die. I speak to doctors accusing the drug companies of distorting the evidence about the drug's side effects. Of course they're going to try to minimize the adverse events because that will increase the sales of their drugs. In its effect, it's certainly scientific fraud. And it, in its effect, it's organized crime. So how do these drugs work, and are they really safe? I've come to the United States to investigate how drugs to lower cholesterol came to be the most widely prescribed drugs in the history of medicine. The 80s saw the debut of a new weapon in the battle against heart disease, a novel class of drugs called statins, 
that lowered cholesterol like no other medication before them. They were heralded as nirvana, the next great thing, because all of a sudden now you're getting 30 to 40 percent reduction with statins, which was huge. And this was great news to the people who were pushing the cholesterol theory because they said, aha, now we don't have to settle for these piddling little amounts anymore. We can really show how important cholesterol is by knocking it way down. Medical information comes along that says you may need to get... In the US, influential more. TV ads like this now, use popular do? actors well, to boast the enormous well, potential of these drugs. Crestor, along with diet, can lower bad cholesterol by up to 52%. But the reality is, lowering your cholesterol with medication doesn't guarantee you won't have a heart attack. The marketing concentrates on the fact that you can lower your cholesterol as if that was the end in itself, which it is not. Cholesterol is just a lab number, you know, who cares about lowering cholesterol unless it actually translates into a benefit to patients. Over the decades, drug companies have had an enormous vested interest in statin drugs. It's the most profitable group of drugs in the history of the world. Something like 15 to 25 billion, with a B, dollars per year spent on these drugs. So it's higher than the gross national product of many countries around the world. Lipitor is the best-selling drug in history. So in terms of costs, total sales of Lipitor have been in the range of $140 billion since it came on the market in 1996. Statins work by disabling a critical step early in the formation of cholesterol. There's a pathway that produces cholesterol in the body. You can think of it like a tree. So we have decided collectively that one of the branches of this tree is bad meaning cholesterol. So we've decided that the best way to get rid of that branch is to cut the tree off at the root. Statins inhibit this enzyme, which is also required for essential molecules like coenzyme Q10. Nutritionist Dr. Johnny Bowden says CoQ10 is essential for optimal heart muscle function. This is partly we believe why so many side effects have to do with lack of energy, um, muscle pain, because coenzyme Q10 is so vital. So what's the irony of giving people a drug to reduce something that probably doesn't even have that much to do with heart disease that also reduces one of the molecules that's most necessary for heart health? How insane is that? It's assumed that cholesterol is a toxic substance in your body and getting it as low as you can is a good thing. Well, cholesterol is the organic molecule that's most common in your brain by weight. It's in every cell wall. It's the precursor of many of the hormones in our bodies. It's an enormously complex molecule. And to think that you can radically pull this out of the body and not have consequences is just, it's ridiculous. It's such bad science. It's been about 30 years since statins were first introduced as the new blockbuster drug in heart disease, and millions of people around the world are being prescribed these medications. But many are concerned that the benefits of these drugs have been grossly exaggerated. <laughs> Professor Rita Redberg is a world-renowned cardiologist. She says barring a genetic condition, the only people who live longer by taking a statin of those that have already had a heart attack or stroke. Valve's working great. That's good. Yeah. And of them, only a very small that. number will benefit. One or two people in a hundred will benefit from taking a statin. What people don't understand is that means the other 98 will get no benefit at all. It's not going to reduce their chance of dying. But this hasn't limited their use. These drugs are now being widely prescribed to relatively healthy people, those without diagnosed heart disease. And Dr. Redberg warns most of them won't benefit. For healthy people, even people that have a lot of risk factors, so they might have high blood pressure, they might smoke, they might have diabetes, the data is not there to suggest that those people are better off taking a stan. No, I don't think it's a wonder drug. But Dr. David Sullivan disagrees. He says all risk factors should be considered equally, including cholesterol. 
if you want to mount these arguments about not treating the cholesterol, you've got to take the responsibility of saying it's not necessary to treat these other risk factors either. I would certainly encourage people who are considering cessation of treatment for perceived side effects and so forth to discuss it with their doctor. In 2012, there was an interesting turn of events. The CTT collaboration, a highly regarded group of researchers, reanalyzed all of the old data with different methods and concluded that statins were effective for the wider population. The report was subject to harsh criticism, but it's still the data that many cardiologists turn to. The media jumped on board and reported that everyone over the age of 50 should be taking a statin to reduce their risk of heart disease, even if you had normal cholesterol. But Professor Redberg says there's a downside. None of those people are less likely to die. So you can take a statin for many, many years and you're just as likely to die as if you had not taken a statin. Unless you've already been diagnosed with heart disease, then taking a statin won't help you live longer. It may reduce your risk of a cardiovascular event, but it may also increase your risk of developing something else like diabetes. Either way, taking a statin won't extend your lifespan. Dr. Abramson says cardiologists are so focused on how these drugs prevent blood vessel disease, they often overlook the other problems caused by statins. People are more than their cardiovascular system. And what we really want to do is improve people's overall health, longevity, and their risk of serious illness. If you look at overall health, we haven't done anything for them. Now, do people want to take a statin to trade one cardiovascular event for some other very serious illness, in other words, no net benefit, and expose themselves to the risk of harm from the statins? Do you want to do that? I think it's a bad deal. If somebody has a particular fear of heart disease and says, look, I don't care if I get diabetes. I, I don't care if I have muscle symptoms. I don't care if I can't exercise the way I want to exercise. I do not want to have heart disease. Fine, take a statin, but understand that that's why you're taking a statin, not because it's going to improve your overall health. Cardiologist Dr. Ernest Curtis says the absolute benefit of statins is so minor that it's unlikely to be because of their ability to lower cholesterol. He says statins probably work through other mechanisms. It seems very likely that the amount of reduction that they saw with the statin agents could easily be due to its effect on the blood clotting and possibly even the anti-inflammatory effect and have nothing to do with the cholesterol. Dr. Galom has scrutinized the data and she's even more skeptical about the value of these drugs, especially in women. Right now, the evidence has not supported benefit to women, even if they have heart disease, in terms of mortality and all-cause morbidity. It has not shown benefit to elderly, even if they have heart disease. In fact, in the 4S trial, there was a 12% increase in mortality in the women in that group who were assigned to statin rather than placebo. So the evidence really doesn't support that the benefit is the same for women and for men. And on top of that, women are at higher risk of complications from statins. Should women take cholesterol-lowering medication? In general, no. Now, there may be exceptions. Medicine actually does have an element of art. And if women are from a family with severe familial hyperlipidemia, where a lot of people are dying from heart disease in their 30s and 40s, that's a group where I would say there is an art. There are now calls for patients to give written consent before taking a statin. If you do plan to give statins to women, to elderly, to people at low risk, they should sign a consent form saying they understand that they're receiving a drug that will not extend their life, but will only shift the cause of death. I think patients have a right to know that before they agreed to take on a medication. The National Heart Foundation of Australia agrees that people are being prescribed statins unnecessarily. I would agree that there are people in, a, in Australia today who are being treated for cholesterol where their cardiovascular risk is not high and you would have to question whether they should in fact actually be on that. 
A report estimated around 75% of people taking statins are in the low to moderate risk category. And according to these researchers, that means up to 30 million people are taking a drug that won't offer them the benefit of living any longer. My doctor pointed out that my cholesterol levels were high and I should take some sort of medication to reduce the uh, cholesterol level. There was nothing wrong with Edward's health, apart from his high cholesterol. He took his doctor's advice and began taking a statin. After about two weeks, I was having a difficult time walking in the daytime. And at night, I had trouble sleeping. My legs ached. I was definitely experiencing a memory loss. Uh, I, I didn't feel as that I could recall things as clearly as I did before I was taking the statin. Statins have a long list of side effects like muscle weakness, memory loss, and in rare cases, a potentially fatal condition called rhabdomyolysis, where muscles break down and cause kidney failure. Edward decided to stop taking his medication. I start feeling better after about three weeks to maybe a month afterwards. How long did it take for you to get 100% improvement? 100% better took from the time I stopped taking the statins, took six months. They feel like they're in a fog. They can't get out of their chair. Side effects that go away when they've stopped their statins. And I have patients come in and tell me they'd rather be dead than keep taking the statin. Some of them tell us that their doctors fire them as patients if they discontinue their statins, which I really wonder about the ethics of. Some of the people that we hear from also say that their doctor didn't believe them, that their problem couldn't be due to statins, and based on how patients perceive it, badger or bully them into resuming or continuing the medication. That's not an acceptable way for medicine as a system to be run. But Dr. Sullivan says it's possible that patients talk themselves into having side effects. In alerting patients to uh, some undesirable possibilities, and in fact maybe even through the power of suggestion, lead them to believe that they're experiencing those particular issues, uh, which they would then blame on the drug, when in fact it might be uh, arising from other factors. Their imagination? Um, look, I'd be reluctant to... Uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of these things aren't imagined. I think there are days when you can feel more of a muscle, muscle ache than, than others, and it can be age, it can be all sorts of other things. Dr Galom makes a stunning accusation about why she believes some doctors in the US may push their patients to take statins. I think they often intentionally hide those risks because there are often physician incentives that benefit the physician for having more patients on statins. So it pits physician self-interest against patient benefit. This particular woman contacted me and she had left the practice that she was at because they insisted that at least, I believe it was 80% of her patients be on statins. This has actually been written up in media as something that is actually considered legal and acceptable. I can't see any way in which that's acceptable. I'm literally the only researcher I know who studies this class of drugs who has a policy not to take money from industry. Statins are meant to be lifelong medications, but Dr Curtis says we don't know about the long-term side effects. The studies that have been done have generally been just a few years in duration. The long-term effects may not show up for many years. Uh, it may take many years for a cancer to the, that develops to make itself manifest. Uh, because cholesterol is so important in the brain, uh, could it contribute to dementia when someone gets older if you lower their cholesterol? We don't know. Again, how would we be able to tie that to the drug? So all of these concerns about the unknown long-term side effects are very serious, in my opinion. Harvard doctor John Abramson is an expert in litigation involving drug companies. He says we're not being told the whole truth about the dangers of these drugs. We're told over and over again that statins are extremely safe. And when you look at the results of the clinical trials, you would conclude that they are safe. The problem is that the clinical trials are not designed to pick up all the side effects. 
the CTT collaboration, for example, use mostly drug company data and report very low levels of muscle side effects from statins. But when you look at the side effects in the general population, it's a hundred times higher. Are the trials lying? No, I just don't think they asked the right questions. Why didn't they ask the right questions? It's not in the interest of the drug companies to ask the right questions. So it's creating the impression that the drugs are safe. Another complication with clinical trials is that drug companies don't recruit volunteers that reflect the typical patient on statins. The problem with the study design is, is that we exclude people with chronic disease or um, other comorbidities. We exclude people who are very old or very young uh, and we'll certainly exclude people with other types of risk factors that, or diseases that may interfere with the uh, metabolism of the drug. So we often get a skewed picture of what the side effect profile is. The fraction of people with problems in my sort of real world on multiple medications, et cetera, clinic is far higher. And I would say in that sample, it really seems on the order of a third of patients that develop problems. There are a lot of ways that one can manipulate data in a trial. Trials do what they call a washout period. And what that means is before they choose the people that are going to be in the trial, they give everybody the drug, and the people that have side effects get excluded from the trial. And they say that so people aren't uncomfortable when they're in the trial. But of course, it takes out all the people that have side effects, and that's very commonly done in drug trials. So the side effects would be grossly underestimated? Yes, it would definitely grossly underestimate the number of people that have side effects. They're not as safe as they've made out to be, no. In its effect, it's certainly scientific fraud. And it, in its effect, it's organized crime. Um, it's always difficult to allege intent. But it is clear that manipulation of evidence subjects many people to treatments that those people should never have been subjected to. I think there is criminal activity that goes on. And I think when drug companies act in ways that m misrepresent information that leads to harm, they ought to be held responsible, just like any other individual or organization that conducts itself in a way that leads to harming other people. Drug companies have a history of illegal activity. This is just a sample of the billions of dollars in fines they incur for things like fraud and bribery in any given year. In the 80s, when President Reagan came into office and slashed funding to the National Institutes of Health, it left a gaping hole for private industry to move in. Nowadays, around 85% of trials are funded by drug companies. A review concluded that if a drug company paid for a trial, it was 24% more likely to report the drug was effective and 87% less likely to report the drug's side effects. There is a sense that science is science, so it doesn't matter who pays for it. And yet, because the research is privatized, the fundamental purpose for which it's conducted has changed. It's not to improve the public's health, it's to fulfill the fiduciary obligations of the sponsors and create an opportunity to maximize profits instead of improve the public's health. Some might say that that's a rather cynical view of how science works. To say it's cynical that commercial sponsorship of science taints the science is just totally naive. It's, it's silly. Business is in business. Their job is to make money. We ought to be clear in our public discourse that to say we've got a bias in commercially sponsored research is neither cynical nor paranoid nor impolite. It's a fact. So let's just accept it as a fact and stop being naive at our own expense. But if Big Pharma doesn't pay, it will have to be the taxpayer. A drug now costs about $2 billion to develop. The success rate of drugs is very low. You know, is the public purse going to be willing to chill out in advance for $2 billion for a drug which it doesn't know the likely outcome of? 
Arguably, the biggest ethical issue in science is that drug companies withhold unflattering results. So in the end, what we're presented with is a distortion of the data. Two of the three major drug companies declined to comment. AstraZeneca denied these allegations, stating that all their trials are publicly available. But in 2010, the drug maker reportedly paid a half a billion dollars to settle a class action after being accused of burying information about the increased risk of diabetes seen with their widely prescribed antipsychotic drug, Seroquel. I spend a lot of time as a, an expert in uh, pharmaceutical litigation. And one thing you learn is that you can't possibly know what's going on with that drug unless you have access to the corporate hard drives. If you want to know the truth about a drug, you need to have subpoena power or in litigation discovery that gets you into those corporate hard drives. Because without getting into the corporate hard drives, it's impossible to know what the real benefits and the real risks of those drugs are. Even the definition of high cholesterol keeps changing. In 2004, a US panel of experts decided to lower the threshold of cholesterol, which sparked outrage among many doctors. More and more people think they have high cholesterol, even though they don't have high cholesterol. By changing the definition, it meant that millions more people became eligible for statins. And these thresholds were adopted by many countries around the world. Has this been on the basis of any scientific data? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No evidence whatsoever. Just the theory that less is better. You're creating more patients. You're creating more people who now have something to worry about where they didn't have anything before. But Dr. Sullivan insists this was a good decision. I think what we actually started off with was maybe appropriately conservative targets, which uh, were really um, not in the patient's best interest. So the likely outcome is a further reduction in targets. More cholesterol lowering. Yep, I think that's absolutely uh, to be expected. The decision to lower the threshold of cholesterol was a controversial one. An investigation into the matter revealed eight out of nine panel members had a direct conflict of interest after declaring financial ties to the companies that manufactured statins. We don't have independent reviewers evaluating the data and making independent recommendations. You might ask, am I accusing these people of selling their opinion because they're Getting paid by the drug companies? No, I'm not. I'm not accusing anybody of bad faith. But the people the drug companies choose to pay are people who advocate the use of their drugs and have standing and presence and, and, and reputation that will enhance the sales of their drugs. So do drug companies seek out doctors to be their mouthpieces? Drug companies clearly seek out what's called key opinion leaders. These are people with a national reputation, who can create the street knowledge for practicing physicians that this is the way things should be done. There is ample published literature showing that doctors who receive money from drug companies have more favorable attitudes and prescribing habits towards that drug. There's no question that doctors are influenced by drug companies. I, mean, I hate to say it, but drug reps showing up in nice suits and fancy women's clothes without much medical education play a significant role in what doctors think. Now, there's no reason for doctors to be getting their information from drug reps. My goodness, the drug rep's job is to increase the sales of the drugs they represent. Doctors need to take some responsibility. They need to do their best to get independent knowledge, and they need to put political pressure on their governments to get the clinical trial data unsealed so they can know what the clinical trials really showed. Many doctors feel obliged to follow the guidelines, even if they don't agree with them. They have to worry about malpractice suits if they don't follow the guidelines. An opposing attorney could make them look very bad in court by saying, well, doctor, do you think you're smarter than this uh, national group of recognized experts? 
And this is a factor that is impelling doctors to follow the guidelines. The push to lower cholesterol in the wider population continues. A group of doctors published an article claiming that statins could counter the effects of eating a burger. They suggested that statins be handed out as free condiments, just like ketchup. Because it gives people that false reassurance that it's okay if you eat this food that is not good for your health, because then you're going to take this pill that's going to make it okay. And that's very attractive, but it is a fallacy. It's just not true. And it's still bad for your health to eat processed foods, eat trans fats, and have a regular diet of fast food hamburgers. And the absurdity doesn't stop there. Here in the US, it was even suggested that statins be put in the public water supply. I think this idea of handing out statins willy-nilly to everybody is totally irresponsible. You're talking about a drug with potentially toxic side effects and a drug whose, quote, beneficial effect is extremely small and whose benefit can be achieved with much less toxic drugs and even with some non-drug treatments. We're missing the message that health rarely comes out of a bottle. Exercise and a Mediterranean-style diet is the best way to prevent heart disease. I think virtually everybody agrees with that. Now, it's very clear that when you look at the effects of exercise, they're far more powerful than statins. Moderate exercise, exercising the equivalent of two hours of brisk walking a week, adds about two years to your life compared to not exercising that much. Two years. Now, for statins for low-risk people, no benefit in longevity. So do you want to exercise, which is going to add two years to your life, or do you want to take a pill that's not going to lengthen your life and has the risk of side effects? It's craziness. Until the science of clinical trials can break free from commercial interest, then decisions about our health rest in the hands of big business. The views expressed in this episode of Catalyst are not intended as medical advice. Please consult with your doctor regarding your medications.